So we saw Killers of the Flower Moon last night. There was some dude in the theater that after about 30 minutes in, he was loudly snoring through the rest of the movie. Is that a good representation of how this film is going to play out? Based on a true story and told through the improbable romance of Ernest Burkhart and Molly Kyle, this tracks the suspicious murders of members of the Osage Nation, who became some of the richest people in the world overnight after oil was discovered underneath their land. So that synopsis, which came from Apple, it leads you to believe that this crime drama is full of mystery. Truth is, there's almost zero mystery to the story, as we're shown all of the actions and motivations right from the start. Now, I know the novel that this is based on holds the details much closer to the vest, obscuring items and conversations so that there can be a shocking revelation later in the story. We don't get that here. Now, you already know that the movie is a long one because that seems to be one of the main marketing messages outside that this could be the best film ever from Martin Scorsese. It's about three and a half hours long, and there are parts where I certainly felt the time going by. This plays out like a Western, so some of the slowness is inherent within the storytelling, drawing out conversations and scenes, not for the sake of making them longer, but to create suspense and allow the majesty of the visuals just to envelop us. But with that, there are at least two specific moments that I was scratching my head as to why the scenes were extended for so long. There's this wedding sequence, and during that, the camera spends an inordinate amount of time watching some dude dance by himself. I mean, the frame pans up and down as he just bebops his way around this tiny little space, using up at least a full minute just to watch him groove. There's zero point to this. I mean, the dancing doesn't hold any foreshadowing, meaning, or even relevance to the rest of the movie. This was a strange editing decision because it appeared to be pointless. There's another scene that involves imagery of fire. Now, it makes sense, it fits within the narrative, and it supports story elements, but it's revisited a few times and the scene just plays out for far longer than it needs, reducing the effectiveness of the meanings. And these sequences, they came across as self-indulgent, inserted just because they could be, regardless of whether or not their inclusion reinforces the narrative. Now, the acting in this I thought was stellar, with Lily Gladstone being one of the biggest standouts in this. And I thought both De Niro and DiCaprio, I thought they were excellent, but the attitude, patience, facial expressions, even restrained quiet that Gladstone brings to the screen, it's utterly captivating. She is a powerhouse and chews through the scenes, even when she has zero lines of dialogue. And her dynamic with DiCaprio, it's fierce and passionate, just showcasing a deep devotion despite the heartache and devastation that she endures. Her performance complements the pace and tone of the story extremely well, patiently doling out her lines and looks in ways that invite viewers in with bated breath. Now, DiCaprio excels at portraying a not-quite-dumb, but certainly not bright, husband-slash-henchman-slash-patsy. Now, he's supposed to come across as sympathetic, but we see all of his true colors immediately, removing any shroud of obfuscation that the story attempts to provide with his true character. Now, this doesn't equal a performance, but the way this story is presented as opposed to the novel, it doesn't allow for as much shock value as the source material provides. De Niro is great as a grandfatherly gangster character. I mean, portions reminded me of his portrayal of Al Capone in the brilliant Brian De Palma film, The Untouchables. There's even a shaving scene in this movie that I felt like it could be an homage. Now, I think his performance is meant to create conflict within us as the audience, keeping us guessing at whether or not he's a good or a bad guy, or maybe even somewhere in the middle. Now, the shortfall, though, is that there isn't any mystery that surrounds his motivations and goals. These are clear-cut and stated plainly from the moment we're introduced to the character, and that takes away from any suspense that the story is attempting to establish. Now, the visuals within the story, they're mesmerizing, employing several different filming and editing styles to break up any visual tedium and then create variety. The landscapes, they're stunning, showcasing the openness and grandeur of the Osage land, and then how it's contrasted with the greed and overrunning of white people into the towns who are there in hopes of wrangling out some of the wealth. That theme of greed, it's woven throughout the story, reinforced by just a whole bunch of actions. And this is meant to also create doubt in our impressions of the characters. But again, because all of the motivations are just blatantly spelled out from the beginning, there isn't any doubt as to who can be trusted and who's just a greedy slimeball. Now, the film concludes with a very strange sequence. It completely broke me out of the narrative that had already been unfolding. Now, I was still sucked into the performances and the drama, even if the intrigue wasn't present, but once we arrived at that finale of the movie, I felt almost duped in everything I'd just seen. 
Part of my family likened the ending to a Wes Anderson movie, which normally, hey, that's not a bad thing, but this wasn't Anderson's project. So to have the tone and the appearance of the movie change so drastically as that conclusion, it just left me confused with that choice. This also lacks some explanation, which is detailed quickly in the novel, but the presentation of what were shown worked to negate everything we'd seen prior, turning it into a work of fiction purely for entertainment rather than an accounting of the genocide that was happening to the indigenous people. And for that matter, while the movie starts with some exposition relating to the murders that were occurring, the story focuses more on the scheming that's being carried out with the results ending with a lot of murders rather than maintaining the attention on the local conspiracy that was systematically wiping out an entire people group just to steal their land and wealth. Now, for me, this gets lost a bit within the movie's narrative, and I know the central point of the story, at least in the novel, it's to be wrapped up in the mystery that's involving the three leads. But since that obfuscation doesn't exist in the movie, the genocide would have been better served to take a more prominent place in the story, since we already know exactly how they're all happening and by whom. Now, Jesse Plemons has a small role within this as an FBI agent. He brings his trademark slow and Columbo-like inquiries to his character. Now, I enjoyed him in the role, but he doesn't come onto the screen until about two hours in. So his screen time, it's relatively minor compared to some of the others. Now, I loved his presence, especially with the determination that he patiently exhibits within his eyes. He comes across like a bloodhound that's on a scent and is totally content to just take as long as necessary in order to catch its prey. Several time jumps in the movie helped to demonstrate the passing of years. Sometimes, though, they were indeterminate and they created confusing scenarios. At one point in particular, the scene resolves from black to a house full of white people milling about and then a few of the Osage are present. We know this is Gladstone's home where she, DiCaprio, their children, and her mother live, but there is an overwhelming amount of white people that I had zero clue or context of who they were or why they were there. I mean, are they married to some of the Osage people? Were they the white servants' families? The cinematography of the screen was enveloping because of how just the camera moves seamlessly throughout the house to capture the chaos of everybody getting ready in the morning. But a large chunk of that scene is also completely pointless because of that ambiguity of who all the people were. I know a lot of people are going to fawn over this movie, especially because it's directed by Scorsese and stars his darling duo. Now, for me, this was good for a long one-time watch. The cinematography is beautifully captured, and while there are indulgent sequences that linger on non-essential scenes too long, the slow, meandering pace works to establish an engaging and satisfying cadence that allows us to connect with the characters and become invested in their journeys, with Lily Gladstone delivering a standout and spellbinding performance. The film makes a huge misstep by removing all the mystery that's present within the novel, instead providing all the insight, motivations, and outcomes right up front, transitioning this movie from a horrifying mystery into a clear-cut mobster tale. It's not really any sex or nudity, some profanity, and a lot of brutal violence. I give Killers of the Flower Moon three and a half out of five couches. So have you seen this one yet? Do, what did you think of it? Also, what's your favorite work of Scorsese? Let me know all of that in the comments below. If you enjoyed this review, please give it a like. Also, don't forget to share and subscribe. I'm Chris. This is Movies and Munchies. Thanks for couching with me.